All right, me hearties. Hardies? They have Hardies back in the Midwest. They have them in Ohio. Hardies restaurants. Do they? See, there you go. Uh, yes, they do. And did you enjoy them? I can't recall. It's been a long time. They were the uh, they were uh, grilled. They had the grill line marks on them and stuff. They were delish. About two in the morning. Mm. <laughs> Really good. Yes, man. more delish because it was two in the morning exactly. than the actual, you know, probably, probably meal. All right, I am. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, the next few minutes are a bit of a reunion for me. Uh, former Mayor Mike Acali, now a uh, hops industry salesperson and all around beer making kind of guy, uh, joins us to talk a little bit about uh, elections, electioneering. He and I, of course went through the depths of hell as the city wrestled with our um, election system and the ACLU lawsuit and uh, the judge's determinations and, and all of that. Um, did, we, uh, did we ultimately get it right? I don't think so. Um, I think others feel the same way. And so, Micah, welcome aboard. Thank you, Dave. Good to have you. Now, you have had ongoing conversations uh, with Chris Novoselic. Tell us who Chris is and what's his perspective. Yeah, Chris is, um, he was with Fair Vote for a long time, the chairman of Fair Vote, and they promote election reform and have really had a great mission of trying to raise awareness on these issues that not a lot of people care about until you have to care about them, like you're sued by the ACLU and then forced to change a system that you've had in place uh, in a jurisdiction for many years. Uh, the, the city council in Yakima and the county commission are laid out very similarly. In fact, I'm surprised at this point that the Yakima County Commission hasn't been kind of approached. But uh, Chris is a, a, a basis of Nirvana, and he's also... Yeah, he was a bass player for Nirvana. That's what everybody will tune into first, right? Yeah, great so, guy, and he's uh, really a policy, you know, I, I don't, you know, he's really into policy. He's really into uh, making real change and working on these kind of issues that maybe aren't going to be brought to the surface. But he had called the, the city of Yakima and wanted to meet with us uh, on the council and talk about our lawsuit and gave us some really good advice, some great resources to really look into how we can take this opportunity as we're being you know, sued to change our system and make it change for the better. And we actually proposed that as a remedy to Judge Rice when we went through all this, as Dave said, uh, long ago. Mm -hmm. And the judge didn't, uh, you know, because we could propose our own remedy first, but the judge didn't like that, went with the ACLU's recommendation to do these exclusive only districts with two majority and minority uh, in favor of Latino candidates as far as the way the population and the demographers worked out. And so uh, now's a chance to come back to the table uh, years later and kind of reflect on what's happened in the city of Yakima and is this system that we have in place been working for us? And if it's not, how can we make it better? And that would be by, in, at least in my opinion, proposing a modified at large. In fact, um, Dave, you and I were at large council members <laughs> Uh, with Bill Lover, rest in peace, uh, Councilman Member Lover, and we ran at large, and we looked at the city from a global perspective. And even the primary system, where you had the the districts, where you'd have primary only, then the whole city would vote. That was kind of the beef: is that, well, West Valley or the population bases will just wash out any of the district's interests in these in the old system. So right, it would you could uh, you could have uh, your ethnic voter block ready to send you through. And, and take you through on the primary, but now all of a sudden the entire city votes. And of course, since I'll say it, we're all racist. Just kidding. Um, that they, they then can't uh, sustain their primary victory and push on. Except that you know, you, a, a look of forty-five years of of uh, voting under this system, you you won't find that that really ever happened. But the potentiality was there, and that's what the ACLU seized on. And uh, don't forget, Micah. They, uh, um, I had, uh, I had my heartburn with, with uh, the Democrat Party and how they were uh, behind a lot of this. This was not a bipartisan for the good of the voter. This was a we need to carve out some Democrat seats because in Yakima County, Democrat Hisp Hispanic seats equal Democrat seats, and and we know that because when you had uh, Hispanic candidates who've ran who were Republican, they get shelled. Wait a second. We're supposed to vote to, uh, uh, to, to use their language to select one of our own. 
except that if you're Enrique Jevons, you're not one of their own, and so you don't win. It's like, come on, man. This whole thing was really, I got heartburn still. I started digging into this. But So we've been a few years. We've had a few runs of council. We, we've seen how well it has and hasn't worked. You take a look at what's going on over there now with uh, Jason White. Uh, and, uh, you know, m maybe you say that's just one individual, uh, and, and that might be true. But uh, by and large, we, it, it has not panned out effectively for effective representation for all parts of the city. No, and there's I, no leverage and there's no ability to uh, make adjustments under this system. Well, so. no, I'm glad Richard's here today because he follows this stuff, but you're not, you know, you're not like we mean we come with the perspective of having gone through the litigation and maybe a little chip on the shoulder from being removed by a federal judge. But I had to let all that go, which I have, as you mentioned, uh, I John I Haas is one of the best things that's ever happened to me in the hop industry. But um, but now to come back years later and say, I'm not involved in local politics directly. I watch things, I see things, but now's the chance to propose some new districts to say what you said. And I don't know, Richard, your observation of the city of Yakima, but would love your thoughts on how you think this kind of went down from uh, your perspective. Well, from a, 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 a citizen voter's perspective, I thought what it did is water down the, uh, uh, the quality of the candidate is what it did. You know, we didn't really have a problem before with, say, Hispanic folks running. They just never really put a viable candidate in front of us. If they had, maybe they would have won. Now what we have, we haven't really fixed that problem, but what we've done is we've chased some otherwise quality candidates away and uh, and and we've ended up with the slate of folks that maybe aren't as qualified. That's how I see it. Now, look, I'm realistic about it. Every council, you could point to every council and say they were dysfunctional in some way or another. Uh, but if the goal was to, to among other things, besides representation, uh, fix the dysfunction, that certainly didn't happen. Okay, we're as if not more dysfunctional than we were before. And we have less uh, Latino representation on the city council. Right. You've had uh, Dulce, you've had Carmen, you've had Avina, mm -hmm. uh, all come and go. The only current sitting member is Elena Macias, who I had actually sent an email to and reached out to and have not heard back yet on kind of wanting to discuss this issue because she is that, that voice on the current elected body. But I have a website you can go to, actually, yakimavoter.info. Mm -hmm. It's yakimavoter.info, and it lays out very simplistically, everything that I'm talking about here from why we need to do this to how it would work. And you'd still have seven seats on the city council, but you mm -hmm. have five districts. Two of the districts would be majority minority districts. And then the remaining two seats would be um, of the five districts would be at large modified. So you could have a voice and a vote in not only your district, but also the at large positions, which would be really cool for, I think, people that can have a say in a couple races and the way this is structured is is totally necessary at least to consider especially without having a strong mayor's system so you have a council manager form of government a fractured council you got council member jason white who's not even showing up to meetings and and saying that in protest if i were going to protest that i would just go to the meetings and still Raise represent hell. and advocate yeah. and try to figure it out or or when I was mayor, I'd gavel Dave down so I could talk because yeah, his did. arguments were usually better. And he read, you know, the I, I would tease him every time because our city attorney, Jeff Cutter, would always say, man, did Dave, he, Dave, read, he reads everything in the packets. And then he does his own <laughs> research. But it's hard. It's hard to be a council member. This is not an easy job. This issue is not something that I think unless you can gain some momentum around uh, people signing on to this initiative. So. If you're interested in, in changing our system and getting away from what I think is is the wrong approach with these district seats and making some real change that's different, that you mm -hmm. haven't seen and trying something new, now's the time to do that. And Judge Rice, I think, has the ability to, because to, our elections are basically still in receivership. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, when you consider that, you know, District 2 produced 807 <laughs> votes total, 2017 District 6 had 3,545 I mean, it's almost, uh, you know, 2,800 more votes. Uh, how, how is, who's watered down with that? Who, who has more uh, zip per, per proportion of representation? You can get into the weeds on, on a lot of this, but 
Um, the actual way the system would work, Micah, that you guys have been talked about, um, how, how would the actual voting take place? So you would have the five districts that would be district only, um, but there'd be no primary. I think it'd just be a general, I believe. Okay. Um, and I got to get this right because I've been <laughs> trying to keep it straight in my head. And then the, um, the at-large seats, you would, if you were living in the district, you'd still get a vote, but the top two candidates for the at-large position It'd be one. It'd be one race, but the top two from that race would become right. elected. So the four of us in here, Jack, you, me, and Micah, could all say, "Hey, I want to run for the at-large seat." Jack and Micah get most of the votes. You and I look at each other and say, "What the heck happened?" And then those two go on to fill those seats. Boy, they've really watered things down, haven't yeah, they? Clearly. Well, I was elected at one time, so <laughs> I mean, it's so interesting to look back on on the time and. I still care a lot about the city of Yakima. It's so important to not just agriculture, but um, you know our community is really special here, and we've got a lot of work to do, and we've had a lot of work to do, but you need to get the door open for a lot of people that want to run. I mean, mm -hmm. the excitement around this year's race with Brad Hill coming off and Kay Funk coming off, there's these, you know, we've gone through these cycles where there's a lot of opportunity and open seats. Uh, been following Matt Brown, there was a new candidate, Lisa, uh, who just announced right remind me her last name wallace wallace right. yes so, so this and and it's really good to see people putting I, i've been pushing joe Mann, the mayor of downtown like joe get in the game and he's he feels he can do more from you know being an activist and a and a citizen but um and running his business and being involved in things but what are the arguments against the change that was made was that you'd need at-large positions so that there's someone on the council who's looking at things from the city overall rather than just in the area where they live, and that an all-district voting situation sets up one area of the city pitted against another, right. but nobody looking at what's best overall. Right. This would help fix that, right? It would definitely make a progress in that area and take away some of the, as you talked about, you know, fighting for streetlights in your district. And especially when you're carving up a budget and the city of Yakima is a class A city that runs their own utilities. They've got a large operation. It's a big corporation with a lot of employees. And when you start using your influence or seniority to steer money to your district or your area, you're not taking into consideration projects like we had worked on with the YMCA. On 40th, we took a lot of heat for that about competing with private health clubs. And I tell you what, I took my son, my my four-year-old son there to swim, learn how to swim, and just looked around in awe of the private money that went into that, but the little boost from the city at large, and it's pretty much right in the center between the east side and way out in West Valley, right, uh, right off the highway. And it doesn't matter what your income level is, what your ability is. It's just so cool to see it there and have some progress in that area, but. The same with streets now. You're looking at, we had paved a lot of these lane miles and potholes, and uh, now you're starting to see things deteriorate again, and nobody wants to kind of have the taxing conversation. But if you're at large, you're not just worried about taking care of your, your district. You're worried about how's the city functioning as a whole. And I want to give a shout-out to uh, Mayor Patricia Byers. Does a great job of communicating and getting the word out and kind of unifying things. She has been a stabilizing force on that group uh and very much so nice to see her uh stepping into that leadership role and position to to really kind of calm the waters as we look at moving forward you know the, it's a matter of of uh, responsibility uh, you are responsible to the people who elected you right and so you need to represent them if you step out and look for a citywide solution and you're the people that are re represent uh, elected you uh, don't like it well then doing the right thing is costly to you uh, we shouldn't set up a situation that way. We should have a situation where there are people who are unencumbered of by the moment to be able to look at the big picture. And I and I agree with this. All right, we've got to take a quick break for news. Can you stick around a little while longer, Mr. I'd Mayor? I'd love to. All right, we'll be back. It's the morning news. News Talk 1280-KIT. It's the morning news. Now, Mike Acaulay in here talking about elections and election systems along with Richard and myself. And I want to just throw this out there. Um, why do we care about systems? Why do we care about the operational detail? Most people's eyes roll back in their head and they start snoring and they want nothing to do or you hear crickets. Why, why do people need to worry about systems? 
Well, systems matter. And I think we found that out during the Trump era uh, of what happens when your systems get sideways, when they, the checks and balances aren't there properly, when everybody is not aware of what their responsibilities are and how they're supposed to go if there's not any sort of um, uh, oversight or, or leverage capability. Uh, you know, we had a, we had a train wreck uh, which derailed, I think, uh, what could have been an awful lot more good progress, COVID accepted. So um, I think that's in and of itself one reason to say, look, why should I care about this? You know, I just, I've got a vote, I'll go vote, and that'll be it. Well, d does your vote carry the biggest bang for the buck? Does your vote send the message that you want it to send? Um, does the system allow for uh, y you to demonstrate your concern or displeasure uh, right now um, you know the take the city manager's job or the mayor you know the city manager manager is what we'd always talked about was that uh, he you know four council people make the decisions so if he's got four in his pocket and that's not a pejorative that's just if he's got four people that are <laughs> supportive of him and his approach there's nothing that anybody else in the city can say or do about it no, and you, but you can't blame Dick Zace anymore, and maybe Dick was uh, underappreciated to some extent for being able to operate in the system that he had and to be able to align votes around things like that. But the council manager form of government, as Dave's talking about, is what you have in the city of Yakima, and the council members that you represent, that represent you, how they're elected is important. And because we, we were at large members, we had that global view of the city. And since we've gone back to this ACLU remedy of single districts only, it's been tough, I think, and it's been it's been different. It's been like you said, Richard. You could you could look at any council and maybe say there was some dysfunction or some challenges and things. But I do believe there's been this this lack of consistency that's been able to at least bring these th this group together in this system. And so um, you asked the question we were talking about. I'm not sure if it was on air or off air, but. How, do, how does this actually get implemented and how does it work? Yeah, right. What do you have to do to make another change? So state law now with the Voting Rights Act being passed does allow cities to adopt remedies that are not single district only, which is a big change. But it doesn't force it upon them. It just allows them to do that. And I've talked to Representative Chris Corey about that, who's working hard in Olympia for our district and who's watching this issue and has some concerns about things, but is willing to, to look at maybe a change in the system. And so... Uh, because the census is coming out, the, that information, and the council has to redraw districts now and propose to the judge what those could be like. Now's the time to do five, five district seats. You know, two of those districts would be a majority Latino, and then you'd have the two at-large positions. It's called modified at-large. And all this info is available for you at yakimavoter.info. Mm -hmm. That's the website. And you can even sign on to this and say, I support it. But it's got to be picked up by the city council, in essence, and... Um, you know, that part of my next steps will be reaching out to, to the current council members and seeing if we can gain some support around getting these districts drawn up and trying something new and seeing if it works. And maybe it doesn't work. Maybe you change the system down the road again. But what we have now has not, not been effective and from my perspective. And it's not, a, it's not an old council member who served his time and is sitting here bitter because I, you know, my term ended two years. It, it's early. And I think that was wrong because... I don't understand how federal judges have that kind of power, but I accept what happened. We didn't fight uh, up to a point. We accepted the remedy and the solution, and you and I stepped down. We would have been running against each other had we decided to run again on purpose. They did that on purpose. Yeah, they, they drew the lines with a little bit of a zigzag to make sure that we'd have both been in the same district. And then you would have beat me, and then I'd have been like, oh, man. Then you would have been bitter. You wouldn't be having this conversation. We Look, wouldn't even be. The reunion would never happen on News Talk twelve eighty KIT. <laughs> what? What? Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, sure, we could point to th obvious things like the the not getting the best candidate that one candidate only needs uh, a few hundred votes to win, where another might need you know thousands to win. Uh, that uh, we have areas, one area city pitted against another, it becomes an us and them instead of all of us thinking about what's best for the majority of the people in the city. But, but are those the things we're trying to fix, or is there something else that I'm missing? What are we missing when you say we're not 
this isn't as eff- an effective system as it could be. Well, what- I think, yeah, there are two main points with that. One is you want to see more representation from the Latino community or Hispanic community on the city council. That was a, an identified issue, as we have a large Hispanic population here that's a critical part of our valley mm-hmm. that needs a voice at the table. Okay. And, I've, and I saw that when I was on council, too. Like, you, you know, have... Uh, all white people some of them are a little bit older you know i was a little bit younger but i was diversity Mm -hmm. arguably at 25 years old or 21 years old um and then you had you know kathy coffee came on council maureen atkinson so you had women you know representing there at the table and from different business backgrounds and maureen had a great healthcare perspective kathy had tourism and business i mean these ladies are bright bright individuals then we appointed uh sonia rodriguez true to the council who's Got the legal background and definitely a community activist and go-getter in her own right. We didn't always agree on things, but mm-hmm. I was one of the I was the swing vote that put her on the council and took a lot of heat for that. And uh, so it's not it's not about um, like you said, trying to fix a problem we don't have. But the first is Latino representation. The second is the remedy that that was put in place is not working, and you can you can see it by. Jason White not attending meetings and right. a guy with the last name White beating a Latino candidate in the all Latino district. The irony of that, just we joke about it, but right. it's like, the, you know, it, it's the candidates too you mentioned. So you have an at-large seat that doesn't limit you to the district's at-large positions. You can live anywhere in the city and run. Right. So it allows your representation. You're not restricted by, oh, these seats are up every two years in these districts and I have to live in that area of the city. Mm-hmm. Now you can live anywhere in the city and file for this modified at large position and the top two could win. It's really a good plan that shouldn't be just brushed off or and you do have to dig in a little bit. So I appreciate the, you you taking time to ask some of these questions. Well the the so what well who has the power to affect it? See, we wouldn't have had the original change if a heavyweight like the ACLU hadn't gotten involved, right? We'd probably still have the same system we had before, or maybe we would have changed there may have been some uh, inertia to change the system anyway, uh, just not have to be forced to change it. But who has the power to do this? Is this a is this a big lift, or can the judge, if you make your case, just say, "Yep, we're changing it. That makes sense. Let's do it." Is that what we do? We don't have to take a vote or anything. The courts can just say, "Yeah, I agree with you. Let's change the system." They, the judge can change the system, and it comes from the city council taking the census data and proposing a new, basically the modified at large system to the judge and saying, we've redrawn the districts. And Dave was talking about this demographers we had come in and how at some point you're not going to be able to draw a majority minority Latino district as the population continues to change and shift and the growth of the city of Yakima. So now is the time where the Voting Rights Act allows this, the city council can propose it to the judge, and the judge could accept it and say, yeah, you're right, it's not been working that great. I'm going to go ahead and put this new system in place that's a remedy uh, to the problem that we had early on with the lawsuit, and um, and it could happen. But If, if any of the uh, um, detractors would, would say, like they said in the past, that it would, uh, it would undercut uh, Hispanic voting power, uh, I would remind you that both at-large districts could be people coming out of the east side. All you got to do is get the most votes across the city. Right. So if you're a, a great candidate um, and you make a good case, there's nothing stopping you from being the at-large. I, I, I said it before. I said it when all that nonsense was going on with the ACLU. Run better candidates. If you ran a, a viable candidate, they might actually get elected. But you're not even doing that. You're just saying, oh, the de- deck is stacked against me before you even run? Well, and just because they're nonpartisan positions, as Dave knows, and we made this case, too, is your ideology, your political beliefs, your your history. You know, if you're a registered Democrat like Sonia Rodriguez is, and the city is becoming more and more moderate or kind of split in the urban area. You get into the rural areas, and it's still a very much a conservative stronghold. Mm-hmm. But you're right. It, it comes down to what, what are you saying when you're running for office, and how are you getting the message out there? And if you've got One America <laughs> campaigning for you or different organizations, people are smart, and they're paying attention to mm-hmm. this stuff. And there's a lot of information on the Internet as well. But it comes down to what are you going to do? And and I also think about this too, David. You know, The city manager was underpaid, and 
I took a lot of heat when I first got on and thought he was maybe overpaid, but it's not the case. And the council members are, are underpaid to some extent as if you, you're not going to run if you have to have a full-time job. You know, we're fortunate to have some working members, but it's hard to have a family and a job yeah. and, and, and have $1,000 a month. Uh, right. And do, do and do the kind of work necessary to know what's going on. That's right. Be, yeah, to be fully informed. And and there's not even health insurance. And you talk about, well, this adds cost to government. And it's the wrong direction. It's like for the way our system is and our city is, there's a lot of opportunity to make improvements. But to me, the first step is let's go make progress in in redistricting when we have the opportunity with the census and the judge and the council and see if we can get a change going on. What it's going to do, Richard, is uh, I'm trying to remember uh, under the past census, and when we divided it into uh, seven districts, we went from about uh, you know, 25,000, 23,000 people in a district, because we had four before with three at large. It went down to about 16,000, 17,000. Mm -hmm. The idea, I guess, was that, oh, we'll have fewer people, and you'll be closer to them. I, I don't know that that's ever happened. I mean, I have nobody tell me, man, I'm so glad the way this system works. I have access now that I didn't have before. So, mm -hmm. um, but it also shrinks your pool for candidates. And so when you open it back up to uh, five districts, not four, but five, now you're talking, what, uh, 19, 20, 22,000 mm -hmm. per district. Um, you got a bigger pool to have people want to come forward and, and run. What kind of a time frame, if everything goes the way you'd want it to. What kind of a time frame are we talking about to where if a change was approved, it would actually happen? Well, I believe the census data was delayed, but as soon as that comes out is when the action has to take place. So it's coming up here pretty pretty soon, and there's a little window. Yeah, there's basically. federal regulations about how what kind of time frame you've got to address that. There's also regulations that say uh, you have to be within a certain percentage of an even number across the board. So if it's 16,000 and you are uh, more than 10% above that, then your district has to be shrunk a little bit. Somebody else has to grow. There are definite uh, guidelines for that. Okay. So if you got more questions, yakimavoter.info. I appreciate you guys giving me time to come on and talk about this. It is good to see you again, Dave, good in person, uh, Richard as well. And um, love my Haas family. I, um, you talked about you know hops and beer. It's pretty crazy how uh, when my grandpa was working at the sawmill, I, he'd come home from his shift and pop open a Hams, famous uh, Midwestern sure. beer, and I'd sip the foam. And little did I know, you know, 30 some years later, I'd be working in the hop industry. Sell, selling that foam. <laughs> from the land of sky, sky blue waters. Micah, thank you very much.